Chapter 3, Congress. Okay, so the U.S. has a bicameral legislature. And what that means is that our Congress has two houses to it, the United States Senate and the House of Representatives. And so we talked a little bit about why the U.S. has a bicameral legislature uh, in the last uh, lecture, uh, uh, the last two lectures, actually. So remember that during the Constitutional Convention of 1787, there was a disagreement between the larger states and the smaller states over what type of legislature the new uh, uh, U.S. government should have uh, under the U.S. Constitution. And so remember, the smaller states wanted a legislature where every state would have an equal number of representatives. So they wanted a legislature based on equal uh, representation. Whereas the uh, larger states, the more populated states, thought that was unfair and thought that because they had more population, they should also have more representation. And so what they wanted was a legislature based on proportional representation where each state would have a different number of representatives, uh, a number based on the number of people living in the state. So the more people living in the state, the more representatives it would have in the Congress. So in an effort to uh, resolve that argument, the states decided to uh, have a compromise, what we call the Great Compromise, and thus create uh, a bicameral legislature, a Congress with two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate. The House of Representatives is based on proportional representation, meaning that every state has a number of representatives based on the number of people living in the state. So larger states like New York, California, Texas, Florida have more representatives in the House than smaller states like Rhode Island or Delaware. In the Senate, the other House of the Congress, uh, representation is equal. So you have equal representation in the Senate. Every state has the same number of, of representatives, two. So there are 50 states today, there are 100 senators. Every state has two. Uh, there are 435 members of the House, however, the House is much bigger than the Senate, and the 435 members are distributed according to population. So New York, again, New York, Florida, Texas, California have Many, many more uh, representatives than smaller states like Rhode Island or uh, uh, Delaware. So uh, because each state has the same number of senators too, and because a senator from a state represents the entire state, not just part of a state, but the entire state, when senators are up for election, as they will be next November, when you go to vote in a state, the whole state gets to vote for the same candidates for Senate. So uh, here in New York, uh, let's say one of our senators, Chuck Schumer, is up for re-election in November. When Chuck Schumer runs uh, next November, everybody in New York will get to vote in that election, either for Chuck Schumer or for whoever is running against him. doesn't matter whether you live in Buffalo or whether you live in uh, on Staten Island or in Harlem. Everybody votes for the same set of Senate candidates. In the House, it's a little bit different because the House, a member of the House of Representatives, doesn't represent the entire state that he or she is from. Instead, members of the House of Representatives 
represent only part of a state, what's called a congressional district. And so each state is cut up into the same number of congressional districts as there are representatives in the House of Representatives. So let's say New York has 30 uh, members of the House of Representatives. New York will then also have 30 congressional districts, and everybody living in New York lives in one of those congressional districts. And so when you go to vote, you don't get to vote for every single representative who's running for election in New York. You only get to vote for the representative race in your district. So, for example, I live in New York's 12th congressional district. I live in Astoria. So uh, congressional district number 12 in New York uh, is made up of Astoria, uh, Greenpoint, Brooklyn, part of Williamsburg, and then the east side of Manhattan. Right? And so my representative is Carol, M Carolyn Maloney. She represents the 12th District of New York. So uh, when she goes up for re-election in November and she's running against whoever's running against her, uh, only the people who live in the 12th Congressional District of New York will vote in that election. Uh, if you live in, uh, let's say, Crown Heights, you live in a different congressional district represented by a different member of Congress. And then so therefore you'll be voting in a different election for a different set of candidates to choose from in next November's election. OK, so the House of Representatives, uh, members of the House only represent a portion of the other state what's called a congressional district, while senators represent the entire state. So we have two senators in New York, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand and Chuck Schumer. Both of them represent the entire state of New York, not just a congressional district, but the entire state. Right. Uh, both chambers of Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senate, are organized by political party membership. So we have two main political parties in the United States, Democrats and Republicans. Uh, most, but not all, most of the members of the Congress are either Democrats or Republicans. There are a couple of independents, but mo most of them are either Democrats or Republicans. Uh, each chamber is led by a member of the political party that holds more seats in that chamber. So... Whichever party has more seats in the House of, of the Congress controls that House of the Congress. So, for example, uh, right now there are more, sen more Republican senators in the U.S. Senate than there are Democratic senators. So that means that the Republicans control the Senate. The Republicans basically make decisions about what the Senate is going to vote on what the, or, or not vote on and because they have more members, if all their members vote the same way then only really the only legislation, the only laws that the Senate will pass are laws that the Republican Party wants to have passed. Uh, Democrats in the minority in the Senate and they don't really have that much of a say because of that. In the House of Representatives, it's completely the opposite uh, because the Democrats have more uh, members uh, in the House than uh, Republicans. So in the House, it's the Democrats who have control. So they make the decisions about what uh, gets voted on and what doesn't get voted on, what, uh, you know, what, what comes up for debate, what doesn't come up for debate. And so... Uh, because the uh, the House of Representatives is controlled by Democrats, the leader of the House, the person we call the Speaker of the House, is a Democrat. And, and right now that's uh, Representative Nancy Pelosi, who is a Democrat from California. She is the head of the House, 
what we call the Speaker of the House. And the Speaker of the House is a very important person, not just because uh, Nancy Pelosi gets to de decide what sort of laws the House is going to pass or not pass, what kind of issues they're going to debate. Uh, but under the Constitution, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, is third in line uh, to succeed the president if anything should happen to the president. So uh, under the Constitution, if anything were to happen to uh, President Trump and President Trump were not able to uh, perform his duties as president either on a temporary basis or a permanent basis, then uh, Vice President Mike Pence would become president either temporarily or permanently. Uh, what if, the, what, uh, however, uh, something happens to both uh, President Trump and, and Vice President Pence at the same time? Well, if something were to happen to both of them, then Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, would become president under the rules of succession that are laid out in the uh, Constitution. The head of the Senate is called the majority leader. Uh, he is the head of the majority party, which today is the Republicans. And right now, the majority leader of the Senate is uh, Mitch McConnell, a senator from Kentucky, a Republican senator from Kentucky. Okay. All right. So what do members of Congress do? They basically have four main functions. They legislate, which means to make laws. They represent the interests of their constituents. Uh, constituents are the people uh, who they represent, the people who live either in the congressional district, in the case of of uh, members of the House of Representatives or people who live in their state in the case of senators. They conduct oversight and lastly they solve constituents pro constituent problems. So let's take each of these one by one and uh, talk about this in more detail. Okay, so the first one, Congress's main function and its most important function is to legislate which means to make laws. Uh, it does this through a committee system. So both houses of Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senate, is comprised of different committees. And each committee is a group of uh, representatives or senators who uh, are responsible for starting the process of passing a law for whatever topic that committee's specialty is. So uh, there are many, many different committees in both houses of Congress, and each of these committees is, is, is uh, focused on one particular issue. So, for example, uh, in both the Senate and the House, there, there, there's a, what's called a banking committee. So any kind of law or any kind of issue that has to do with banking or finance or money is uh, the responsibility of the banking committee. So if the Congress is thinking about creating a new banking law, the first group of representatives who will start working on that proposal uh, for a, a new banking law is the banking committee because they're the ones who have experience and uh, knowledge about banking and about finance, about these kinds of issues uh, to make a good law. So they're the ones who actually produce uh, the proposal for the law, which is called a bill. A bill uh, before a law gets passed, it's called a bill. A bill is a proposal for a law. So if the bank committee in the House of Res Representatives uh, creates a new banking a proposal, a uh, new uh, banking law proposal, a new banking bill, they produce it out of their committee, they write it, they vote on it, and if they approve it, then they... 
uh, present it to the entire House of Representatives, or in the case of Senate, if the Senate uh, Banking Committee does the same thing, they present it to the Senate. And then the whole Senate and the whole House will vote on it. So a bill, a proposal for law, starts in the committee. If the committee votes on it and approves it, it gets presented to the whole House, either the House or Senate, whichever one you're talking about. And that if the House or Senate vote on it and approve it, then it becomes official. The bill gets passed. Now, before a bill becomes a law, two things need to happen. It needs to be passed by both the House and Senate together, not just one or the other, but both because we have a bicameral legislature. Both houses need to pass a bill before it can be sent to the next step, which is to be presented to the president. Okay, so the bill starts off in committee, it gets passed by the committee, it gets passed by the House, by the Senate, and then it goes to the president. Okay, why the president? Because this is part of the idea of checks and balances that I've talked about in the past two lectures. The idea that the founding fathers did not want any one branch of government to have too much power. So they created a system of checks and balances where each branch can stop another branch from doing something that it thinks is wrong and shares power to do certain things like, in this case, passing laws. So part of the checks and balance system is that Congress and the President need to work together and need to agree before a law can get passed. So in order for a law to get passed, and the, uh, the bill needs to be passed through uh, the committee of a congressional house, and then it needs to get passed by the full uh, branch of the Congress. The House does it, uh, uh, and then the Senate does it, and then the bill, if passed by both the House and Senate, goes to the president for his signature. And if the president agrees with the bill, he can sign it, and then it automatically becomes law as soon as the president signs it. Okay. Uh, now, one other thing to mention before we go uh, before we go any further is that uh, in order to pass a bill in the House and Senate. All you need is what's called a simple majority, meaning more uh, members need to vote yes on it than no. So in the Senate, for example, which has 100 senators, if 51 senators vote yes on a bill, it passes. 51 is one more than half of 100. Okay. So if, if a simple majority in the House says yes, the simple majority of the Senate also says yes, then the bill goes to the president. And if the president says yes, he signs it, and it becomes law. Now, what if the president doesn't like it? What if the president doesn't agree with the bill, doesn't want it to become law? Well, then under the theory of checks and balances, he can stop the bill from becoming law. He can prevent the bill from becoming law by not signing it. Uh, and what that, uh, what we call that is a veto. A veto is uh, basically a way of saying, no, I don't agree with this bill, and then uh, the bill doesn't pass. Now, if the president vetoes a bill, that doesn't end the bill's life right then and there, Congress can still pass the bill a second time, uh, overriding the objection of the president uh, or overriding the veto, which is what we officially call, uh, call it when Congress passes a bill the second time uh, after the president has vetoed. It's called overriding the veto. But in order to do that, the Congress needs to pass the bill not just by a simple majority, 
but by a two-thirds majority. So in the Senate, for example, a two-thirds uh, majority would be 67. So if the Senate passes a bill uh, the first time by a simple majority 51 and the president vetoes it, it goes back to the Senate. This time the Senate has to pass it by a vote of 67, uh, 16 more uh senators need to vote yes that's a lot uh that's a much higher number uh and because of that uh it's not often that a presidential veto is overridden it has happened it can happen but it doesn't happen often so really in order for a, a bill to become a law in order for laws to get made you really have to have uh, an agreement between uh, not just the two houses of Congress, the House and the Senate, but also the President. And because of that, uh, especially when you have uh, what we call a mixed government, where the President is from one party and at least one of the houses of Congress is from the other, you really need to have a negotiation process. Uh, where uh, the Congress and the President can decide on a bill, a proposal that they all agree with. And that's, that's what we have today. We have a mixed government today where the House of Representatives is controlled by the Democratic Party, uh, but the Senate is uh, controlled by the Republican Party, and we have a President of the Republican Party. So, uh, in, if, you, if you watch the news a lot or if you read the newspaper, you'll often hear that laws that are passed are the result of sometimes very difficult, very long negotiations between the House, the Senate, and the President. Now, in addition to being able to uh, pass laws, uh, the Senate also has a consultative confirmation authority, and this is only the Senate, not the House, but just the Senate has a consultative confirmation authority. And what this means is that the Senate uh, gets to confirm cabinet secretaries, agency directors, ambassadors, federal judges, Supreme Court justices, and treaties that are proposed by the president. Okay. Uh, so and what, what I mean by confirm is to prove of. So under our present system of government, uh, the president has the right to appoint his own cabinet secretaries, uh, like the, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Treasury. He has the right to appoint his own agency directors, like the uh, head of the Environment, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, has the right to appoint his own ambassadors, uh, uh, the ambassador to England, for example. These are people who represent the United States to foreign governments uh, around the world. Uh, the president has the right to appoint federal judges and Supreme Court justices, members of the judiciary. Uh, and presidents also have the right to negotiate and sign treaties with other countries. A treaty is a formal agreement uh, between the United States and a foreign country. <clears throat> but because, again, uh, because of the idea of checks and balances, the Founding Fathers wanted to make sure that uh, the President did not have the complete ability to appoint all these kinds of people and to solely have the right to uh, make treaties with foreign countries uh, in order to put a check on the president, the founding fathers gave the Senate the right to confirm these people and the right to confirm treaties. So, for example, uh, when the president, uh, when President Trump a couple years ago appointed uh, two uh, 
new members of the Supreme Court, two, two new Supreme Court justices, first uh, uh, Neil Gorsuch and then Brett Kavanaugh, uh, he was able to, to appoint them and say, these are my choices for the Supreme Court. This is who I want to put on there. But they didn't actually become uh, Supreme Court justices until the Senate went through a process of of uh, uh, debating whether they should be on the court and then voting to decide whether they should be on the court. Uh, and in, in both cases, the Senate... Uh, voted yes to agree to have them be Supreme Court justices, uh, but if they had voted no and said we don't think uh, these uh, two uh, judges uh, are the right people, they would not have become Supreme Court justices. So uh, the Senate has to agree, has to confirm uh, to let these people uh, be uh, appointed to their positions. And they also have to, the Senate also has to agree uh, whether a treaty uh, should become American law. So the president can negotiate a treaty with a foreign country, the president can uh, sign a, a, a treaty with a foreign country, but that treaty doesn't become law until the Senate also agrees. Uh, so the Senate's uh, function here is only is only to confirm the president's appointees. They cannot choose who a Supreme Court justice will be. They can only vote yes or no on the person selected by the president. So the president appoints, and then the Senate votes yes or no on that appointment. If uh, In the case of, of uh, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, if the Senate has said, no, we don't uh, approve of them to be on the Supreme Court, then the president uh, would, ha would have had to uh, choose uh, another uh, Supreme Court justice appointee. Uh, so the Senate cannot do that. The Senate can only vote yes or no on the people chosen by the president. Okay. Uh, both chambers of Congress also form the second main function of Congress, which is to represent the interests of their constituents by advocating for laws and actions that benefit the people they represent. So one of the main functions of a, uh, of a senator or a member of the House is to represent the interests of the constituents, which basically means to look out for them, uh, to make sure that the American government and the Congress in particular are doing things that are good for their people. Uh, and since uh, we have such a diverse country uh, in terms of population and geographic areas, uh, the way that a member of Congress from Chicago thinks about representing the interests of the constituents is very different than, say, uh, a member of Congress from a rural part of Texas. Uh, because the interests of people who live in Chicago are very different than the people who live, the interests of the people who live in a rural area of Texas. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we have so many different members of Congress representing different congressional districts from around the country so that Different, the different interests of people living in different parts of the country can be represented well in the government. So how, uh, how members of Congress do this is, uh, varies from state to state and from congressional district to congressional district. Your textbook uses the example of Congressman Norrin Dixon, the member of, of, of the House of Representatives who represents a congressional district in Seattle, Washington. Now, Seattle is home to uh, a lot of military interests. Uh, there are a lot of naval bases, military bases, and uh, Congressman Dixon's uh, district is also the home uh, to the Boeing Corporation, which in addition to making commercial airplanes, also makes a lot of military uh, airplanes and hardware 
for the U.S. government. So uh, a, a big portion of uh, Boeing's business is with the U.S. government, with the U.S. military. And Boeing is a large corporation, uh, employs a lot of people in Congressman Dixon's uh, district. And in order to keep those jobs alive, uh, what Boeing needs is business from the uh, from the U.S. government to to build more planes and more military hardware. Well, who decides uh, what kind of military hardware gets built? Who decides how much money to give to the military to buy uh, weapons and other things from Boeing? It's the U.S. Congress. Uh, one of the main functions of the U.S. Congress is to decide how the government's budget uh, is made and uh, how much money is spent in that budget. Uh, the budget is primarily not the president's responsibility. He has part of the responsibility, but the main responsibility of deciding what the budget is going to be, how much money is going to be in the budget, where money gets spent, is in Congress. So since the Congress decides uh, how much money Boeing is going to get from the U.S. government, uh, Congressman Norm Dixon has made sure that he's on the House of Representatives committees that deal with military budgets so that he can have a direct influence, a direct decision-making uh, role in the kind of budget that bo that the U.S. military gets and how much money the U.S. military gives to Boeing because, as I said before, the more money Boeing gets, uh, the uh, more jobs that there are in Congressman Dixon's district. And if he can run for re-election every two years and say that, well, you know, I've got, I, you know, I've, I've been very successful in getting money for Boeing. Uh, I made sure that Congress has, has given a lot of money to the budget for Boeing. And uh, that's translated into more and more jobs for the people who live in my district, for my constituency. Well... That's good for Norm Dixon because if the members of his uh, constituency, the people living in his district, are happy, they're going to be happy with him and they're going to keep voting for him and he's going to hold on to his job. And so that's very good. Okay, that's, that's a good thing. Okay, uh, and one other thing I, I forgot to mention when I talked about uh, how the Congress is set up before. Uh, members of the House of Representatives uh, serve for a two-year term in office. So uh, every two years, they run for re-election. Uh, members of the Senate serve for six years. So uh, senators serve for a, a much longer term in office uh, than, uh, than representatives. Okay, so uh, the third function of Congress is uh, to have oversight authority, to conduct oversight of the other parts of the government. What does oversight mean? Oversight means to supervise and make sure that the other parts of the government are functioning well, to make sure that uh, the other parts of the government are doing what they're supposed to do, uh, to make sure that uh, there are no mistakes made uh, that can cause a lot of, of harm and to make sure that there's no corruption. Uh, so how does Congress oversee what the other branches do? Uh, it does this and performs this function by conducting investigations and holding hearings. So, for example, if, uh, if, it, if it becomes known that uh, something wrong happened, that, that the uh, president did something wrong or is, is, uh, is thought to have done something wrong, 
then the Congress can conduct an investigation and they can hold hearings to try to find out if something actually did go wrong and to find out why, who is responsible, how did this happen. Uh, what it means to hold hearings is to have a committee, whatever committee is responsible for that issue, whatever issue you're talking about, hold a hearing uh, in public. These are usually on TV. You can watch them when they happen. And at these hearings, Congress will call the people who are involved in whatever happened to come and explain why why things happen to answer questions. Uh, and they can also request documentation from, from whatever the other part of the government is involved to find out what happened. Uh, and uh, the idea, the, the goal of these investigations is to try to get to the bottom of the truth to find out what happened and ultimately to make sure that it doesn't happen again, to change whatever process or system or law needs to be changed to make sure that whatever happened, either by accident or willful corruption, does not happen again. And uh, if Congress thinks that uh, another uh, branch of the government did something that's really, really, really bad, they can actually move to take punitive action against, say, the president uh, by trying to remove him from office, uh, which is called impeachment. Uh, in Under the Constitution, uh, the Congress has the right to try to remove the president through what's called impeachment, which basically means to charge the president with wrongdoing. With, with serious wrongdoing. Uh, it's a two-step process that involves both chambers of Congress. Uh, the first uh, part of the process is for the House of Representatives to impeach the president, to formally charge the president with wrongdoing. And then uh, in the second part of the process, the president is put on trial in the Senate. So instead of going to court, there's a trial in the U.S. Senate, and the 100 senators act as a jury, and they have to vote on whether to, whether they think the president is guilty or not guilty. If the president is found guilty of wrongdoing, then the president is removed from office. If the president is found not guilty, then he is not removed. Uh, you might remember that this happened earlier this year when the Congress that has a representative impeached the president uh, for certain wrongdoing involving Ukraine uh, and uh, he was charged with a crime. Uh, he was put on trial in the Senate but the Senate ultimately found him not guilty and so the president, uh, President Trump, is still president because the Congress failed to find him guilty. Uh, so that's how investigations and hearings work and what they're designed to do ultimately. Uh, Congress also, under its oversight authority, can also uh, create what's called the Special Independent Commission. If they want to deal with something, if they want to investigate something, but not have it be very political, meaning not have them themselves do the investigation, they will put together a group of experts uh, who are outside of the government uh, to conduct the investigation. Now, most often, the people who are appointed to these independent commissions uh, have previously served in government, but usually they don't serve in government at the time. So this kind of the idea is to hopefully remove the uh, the investigation from uh, being so political to being not so political. And so uh, a very famous example of of uh, of a special independent commission that Congress once created was the 9-11 Commission. Uh, about a year after the 9-11 attacks on New York and Washington, the Congress decided to create an independent commission to try to investigate how the 9-11 attacks could happen, 
how they uh, how they were uh, uh, planned out, who was involved, who was responsible, and most importantly, uh, how it is that the U.S. government did not catch it and was not able to stop it before it happened. Uh, the idea here was not to uh, blame anybody, uh, not to uh, charge anyone with a crime, but rather to investigate and find the truth uh, in a non-political way. So Congress decided rather than they conducting the investigation themselves, they created a special independent commission uh, with a lot of experts in the area of foreign policy and national security intelligence. Uh, and it was led by uh, a Democrat and a, re uh, a Republican. Uh, Thomas Kane uh, led the commission. He was a former uh, president, I mean, a former governor of New Jersey. Okay. Uh, so that's, uh, that's how Congress uh, conducts uh, oversight. And the last uh, thing that uh, both chambers do uh, is help solve constituents' problems. They're both able to help solve constituent problems. And what do we mean by this? It means that a problem that one of their constituents, one of the people that they represent, either in their state or in their congressional district, might be having with, a, with the U.S. government, uh, with a U.S. Uh, agency. Uh, so let's say, for example, that uh, I'm a uh, I, I own a company uh, in uh, New York City, and my company uh, uh, is involved in the import export business. So uh, I import goods from other parts of the world and sell them here. And I export goods from the United States to other parts of the world, and I sell I sell them there. Uh, so, uh, in order to do that, in order to import certain things from other countries into the United States, or to sell uh, to ship things out of the United States to sell it into other countries, you need what's called an import. Uh, you need a license, either an import license or an export license. Uh, and this uh, uh, is usually given, well, it's given by various uh, agencies of the U.S. government. Uh, but let's say, for example, that one of the uh, agencies I, I need to get an export license from is, a, is the U.S. State Department to get a license to sell something uh outside of the United States. So uh, let's say, for example, that I apply for an export license to the State Department to get uh, permission to sell goods to uh, uh, other parts of the world. And usually it takes about three weeks to get a, an export license and uh, but three weeks have passed and I haven't gotten my license. I call up and uh, nobody can give me a straight answer. Uh, I'm getting, uh, uh, you know, I'm getting ignored. So what can I do about it? Well, I can call my member of Congress or my senator to try to get them to help me solve this problem. Well, what can they do? Well, they can look into it. They can call up the State Department. They can investigate uh, and try to uh, get the matter solved. Now, why would the State Department pay any more attention to a member of Congress or a senator than me? Well, because unlike me, members of Congress and the Senate, members of the House and Senate, uh, make decisions about how much money the State Department should get in their budget. Uh, they make laws that either help or hurt the State Department. Uh, they, uh, senators can vote to confirm appointees of the president to the State Department. Uh, so uh, Chuck Schumer, my senator, may call the State Department and say, look, 
you know, if you don't have a good reason to deny my constituent this export license, you know, you better give them the license or else I'm going to potentially cause problems for you. Uh, you want to delay him? I'll delay you too, and 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 you won't be happy. So uh, you know, just like very important people, members of Congress and senators get their phone calls uh, answered more readily than if you or I were to call the State Department, uh, and uh, they frankly get more respect than you or I from. Uh, the State Department or any other part of the uh, government. So members of Congress can often be of great help if someone's having a legitimate uh, problem with uh, a sector of the U.S. government, the federal government. So if you want to contact your member of Congress or your senator, you can go to the Internet and uh, do it easily. Uh, if you click on this link here, find your representative, uh, it'll take you to the uh, U.S. House of Representatives website, house.gov. And if you just uh, punch in your input, in my zip code here, click find your rep by zip. And here we go. My representative, as I said before, is Carolyn Maloney. She's a Democrat from uh, from the 12th District of New York. Right here is located in the 12th Congressional District of New York, and this uh, green area here is the tw is the 12th District of New York, Astoria, uh, the side of Manhattan, and uh, parts of Williamsburg and Greenpoint. Okay. And so uh, you've got her phone number right here that you can call her office. Uh, you can uh, you can email her and uh, subscribe to her newsletter. Uh, here services here help with a federal agency, right? what I was talking about before okay so uh, and also another thing that they can help with is immigration cases right so you can uh, call uh, the office and get somebody to try to help you with an immigration case if that's what you need okay all right so uh, we go back uh, find your senator and this takes you to the Senate's website senate.gov and uh, if you choose your state New York and here are our two senators from New York right. Kristen Gillibrand Charles Schumer if I want to contact Charles Schumer here I go right how can Charles Schumer help again request with a f help with a federal agency uh, and then uh, uh, help for New Yorkers, uh, so you can uh, uh, do a lot here. Uh, students, there are internships, for example, in his office. So, uh, if you uh, are a college student and you want to uh, do an internship in Chuck Schumer's office, you can contact the office and apply for an internship. Okay, so there are all sorts of things that you can do. Uh, okay, so uh, that's the end of chapter uh, three. Uh, until next time.